Okay, this is the final day. Today we're going to talk about WordPress multi-site and a little bit more. Uh, we're going to go over another WordPress API. Um, we're going to go over uh, queuing up JavaScript and CSS a proper way in a plugin. And uh, also on a theme, um, if you're not going to use the style.css uh, file that we had talked about when we did the theme section of this course. So, uh, WordPress multi-site is called a network. So when you create a network, you need to decide before you do anything if you want it to be subdomains or subfolders. So the difference is um, a subdomain would be like blueayout.wordpress.com, john.wordpress.com, shayla.wordpress.com. Those are all different subdomains. The folder base would be like wordpress.com slash luayout, wordpress.com slash john. The, the use case really just depends on what you want. Um, and so for wordpress.com, which is an actual service and is actually a multi-site install, um, they want subdomains because with subdomains you can assign actual domain names to the subdomains. So if you're if you have a WordPress.com blog, blueayout.wordpress.com, and you want it to be a real you want people to visit it with a real domain name, blueayout.com, okay, you can through the WordPress.com site pay the ten dollar domain fee, it's an annual fee or something like that. I don't know what the price is. Um, in the WordPress.org installation there's a plugin that you can install and people can say what they want for the domain. So same basic functionality as what WordPress.com offers, but with your own server and site. With folders, you don't get that ability because it's a folder, it's not a domain. and uh, You can't really do a dynamic DNS translation to a folder uh, and keep the same domain name. Uh, so on the College of Education at UGA site, we use folders. The main site is www.code.uga.edu, and then all of our departments have slash kinesiology, slash LLE, or something like that. So they have their own folder. In WordPress, like in the back in the database, it's all stored in the same way. It's all stored in the same folders and everything like that. It's just when it's translated, what the user sees, they see either a domain or, or what would look like a folder on the URL. So if you have a current site and you want to change it to um, a multi-site install, you can do that, but you should back up your site in the database first and deactivate all your plugins. Um, if it's a fresh install, you don't have to worry about that. You can just do the fresh install and then do the multi-site install. So to start the install, you have to edit your wp-config.php file which we talked about in the first day. And you just need to add the line WP underscore allow underscore multi-site multi -site proof uh, right above the stop editing line, and I'll show you that. I have a uh, site installed. It's not multi-site yet. It's just a regular install. There's nothing around here. Oh yes, WordPress 3.41 came out. So let's just update this real quick. Okay. So let's edit the WP config. And there's a stop editing line right here. So before that and so the what is it? Allow multi Save it and upload it. Now we go to our dashboard, which is this is the WordPress dashboard. And we'll just refresh the page. You go to tools, you'll see network setup. So this is where it asks, do you want subdomains or subdirectories? And it gives you an example. 
So since my main site is wpms.luayout.com, an example would be site1 and site2.wpms.luayout.com. Subdirectories would be slash site1 and slash site2. So we're just going to do a sub subdirectory. And you can give it a title if you want and add an email address if you want. Click install. It'll say you recommended backing this up. And then it'll give you different instructions. So create a blog dir directory here. There, there's there. stuff like this. So it says here this directory is used to store uploaded media for your additional site. So in a regular install, all the media is stored in upload slash date slash file name. Uh, in a multi site, it'll be blogs dot dir. I guess I didn't spell that wrong. Blogs dot dir. It's blogs.dir and then the site ID uploads and then date. And add the following to your WB config. file system will look exactly the same. Okay. Just to add these things to our that you can fix. Uh, and this is just saying this is a multi-site install. It's not a subdomain install, it's a directory install. The current site, which is the main site basically, is WPMS the way out. The path to the current site is in the root directory of our site. The site ID and blog ID is one, which is just this is the, the ID given to the main site. You could change this if you want to, if you needed to for some reason. So we'll upload that. And then it wants to add this stuff to our HT access file. So this is a little bit different for me because oops, I don't have an HD access file. And if I create one, it's not going to do any good because I'm not running Apache. I'm running Nginx or Nginx. I'm not sure how to do that in Nginx. But it doesn't matter because we're not going to look at any subsites right now. So, in the real world, you create an HD access file, or if you had one, you'd edit it and add this content if you're using Apache. But I'm using Nginx. So. so, once you've done all this, you click the login button. And you're so one thing you'll see different is you'll have a thing here called my site and a network admin and then this is the same as uh, or similar to the old single install site except you have edit site which when you click edit site you come to this edit screen so let's go back to the dashboard first and just click on network admin. So this is the network admin section of uh, WordPress Mobile. This is where you do all your updates for plugins and themes. Uh, you can change your network settings. 
Uh, you can disable registration. You can enable registration so people can create new sites automatically or create new users automatically. Notifications. Um, allow site admins to create new users if you wanted to. Band name would be good. Uh, you don't want to use any cuss words in your folder names or anything like that. You can put all the cuss words in there. Um, these ones are there by default because they're um, if you're especially if you're using a subdomain install, you don't want somebody to create a site called www because then somebody might go to www.your site and they're going to get their site and it's going to be inflammatory or something or just not what you'd want. Um, so you can go through all these options and change the welcome emails and all that. The important thing is at the bottom, or what I consider to be most important, is the upload settings. You can limit the size of uploads for subsites. So if you only want subsites to be able to upload five megabyte files, you can change this to five. It's set to 100 right now because that's my my default. You can change the type of files that they're allowed to upload. So um, you only want them to upload PDF. You don't want them to upload Word documents. So make sure Word documents is in here. I'm oh, sorry. This is the upload space. This is the file size. So um, I want them to be able to upload 50 megabyte file. Change that to megabyte. But they only they have a 100 megabyte limit. So if they upload two 50 megabyte files, they won't be able to upload any new file. It's just a way to limit the space that's being stored on your on your um, server. Uh, you can remove this check, and then they have unlimited. Um, you can also enable administration menus for plugins, which we'll do. And change the specs to 100 just because. These would be all your plugins. With the plugin section of the network admin, you can network activate a plugin, which means that it will activate on all your sites by default. So this is a little bit similar than the must use plugins directory. The must use plugins directory is always on no matter what the user does on their site. With network activate, it'll turn it on, but they have if they have admin rights, they can log into their site and then they can turn it off. They can deactivate it. So I'm going to network activate hello dolly and themes. This is a little bit different than the way it used to be. Uh, it's a little bit better this way. You can network enable, not activate, network enable a theme, which means that the user has the ability to activate the theme on their site. You could have 50 themes installed on your WordPress multi-site, and, and somebody will log into their site, and they only see one. They can only activate one because you haven't gone in here to enable it for them. So you need to make sure to come in here, enable the theme, if you want subsites to be able to activate that theme. And the users, these are just all the users on your site. And sites, so let's just add a site. And we're going to use that email. All right, we have a new site. So with the site, if you put your mouse over it, you see there's edit, there's dashboard, deactivate, archive, spam, delete, and visit. I don't know if visit will work. Yeah, visit doesn't work. This is because I haven't set up the, my server isn't handling the subsite properly. But obviously the site does work, it's just not looking at the files in the right spot. If you edit the site, you're back to the screen we were at before when there was the edit site option. And this is, you know, you can change the domain, um, if, you're cha if you're changing something about your network install path. Um, the site URL and home, those are 
variables in the database. Uh, you probably want to have this checked if you're changing the path. Um, it's a public site, but you could remove public and it'd be a private site. Um, you can archive it, set it as spam, really mature content if you want. These are all the users that are in that site. This is kind of just a one place to go to look at various things. These are the, the themes that are um, network enabled to the site. And then some general settings. Blog name, if you wanted to change the blog name of their site. You can do most of this stuff um, from their dashboard too, if you're an admin. So there's just a ton of options. So if we go back to all sites, if we go to dashboard. No, I don't think it's going to work. Sorry, I, just, I totally forgot I was using Nginx. I don't know if this is going to work, but let's see. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's a lot uh, faster. I used to use Apache on my server. I, I have another server that I use Apache on because I haven't switched it over yet, but I like Nginx. And here at the college, we use Apache.
Alright, let's do this. This is our WordPress install. So basically, we've gotten to this point. Not accessible for the I should be. So we have a site called Torrent. Click on Dashboard. You get it just looks like the normal WB admin dashboard for this Torrent site. You see it's different. Torrent, WP admin. Everything is the same. Posts, media, links, page, comments. They have a plugin that does slide. If you go to the plugin section, you can see there's a number of them that are not activated that if they have admin rights, they can click activate on them. Uh, that don't have any of them activated. I guess, I guess slides is part of the theme then. Uh, and yeah. Plugin, do you have to network activate the plugin before? No. No, you can, you can just install a plugin and they can come in and activate it. But if it's a plugin that you want activated by default on, on a new install, do network activate. Or if you, if you want it in, you know, network activated. Okay. Network admin, you know, um, control what plugins are available to you. So, right. If well, kind of. I mean, I mean that, that is to say they can go out and get. They cannot add new plugins. Okay. Right. Right. If there's if somebody wants a, a plugin, they'd have to come to you, and you'd have to verify that it's a okay plugin to use, and you'd install it on the on the network admin section. And you could network activate it, or you could just have it installed, and then they could activate it. Uh, oh, okay. But they they don't have any ability to add new plugins. Can you set up a plugin that only certain stuff? Whatever Whatever sites? Not there's no deep, there's no built-in way to do that. There's probably a way to do it. Um, one thing that I would probably do is, if it's a plugin that you only want certain sites to use, is to put that plugin in the MU plugins directory, and then with a script, check for the blog ID, and if that blog ID is three, you know, whatever the blog ID is for this site, then include that plugin file. It would, it would always be on, they wouldn't have the ability to deactivate it at that point, but that would be one way of controlling a plugin for a specific um, if we go to appearance and themes, these are all the themes that are installed and enabled on the dashboard. If we were to install another theme and didn't enable it, they wouldn't be able to come in here and activate it, but they could come in here and see. And the same thing would be true for this is if you wanted a uh, specific theme that only want certain sites to use, you have to do some WordPress stuff behind the scene to make sure that only they see it. Um, I've never done anything like that, though. Uh, users, now this will be all the users that are assigned to this site. It's not going to be all the users on the network itself. So if they were to add a user, it would show up here. And that would show up on the network, you know, if we go back to network admin and users. It will show all that. Users, in fact, it shows what sites that they're assigned to. Tools, they'll have similar tools. Uh, if they have admin rights, they could delete their site. Um, they can export their data, import data into their site, and stuff like that. The available tools are just going to be this press list, press this thing in the category tag for it. And their settings are going to be, you know, exactly the same as the settings on a normal WordPress install. Same thing with writing and reading and all this. Permalink is a little different. Um,
I don't know if this is showing me this because I'm an admin or not. I could be wrong, but I thought that maybe it is. If, if permalinks aren't enabled on the main site, they won't have the option here. Because you know, some people don't have permalinks set up on their server. It's, you know, you need to have the HD access file or set up engine properly to work with it. Um, so it may not work if permalinks aren't enabled on the main site. Any questions so far? Or any other questions so far? Um, so this is pretty much it. Basically, WordPress multi-site is just WordPress to normal users. Um, it just gives you added ability to manage the site. And it's good for situations where you have, you have 50 sites. And they're all WordPress installed. And there's an update for WordPress. And you have to, open, you have to update 50 sites. Now, in our situation, we have one WordPress install with 50 sites. There's an update, you click the button once, and then there's a, another button um, that will update the subsite. Like it'll update the databases and stuff like that if they're, if they're used to it. Um, no, let's look at that. Change this. Okay, this is my WordPress multi site. So there's obviously a lot more. If we look at the WP training, there's only you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 tables. If we look at WPMS, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 20 times. So, <clears throat> all these, or really all these, are the defaults. The well, the registration and signups, site, site meta, blogs, and blog versions get added to the database when you create a new network install. So, site is just information about the site. Site meta is meta information about the site. This is a network install now. Still has an options table. And this options table applies to the main site. Uh, users is, is shared amongst all blogs. Uh, terms are specific to the site. Uh, post meta and posts options specific to site, links, comments, meta, specific to site. Then there's blog and blog version. Blog lists the blogs. It should, really should be called sites, but it's old nomenclature. So we have our main site and we have training. This is the blog ID. Training blog ID is two. Uh, blog versions. It just basically tells you when it was last updated. Uh, if you do like a network install or a network update. Now these up here, these all apply to the second site, we, uh, the site we just created, the training site. It has a two here, that represents the blog ID. So again, terms, term relationships, term taxonomy, post, post meta, options, all these tables are specific to that site. It's the exact same tables you'd see in a normal WordPress install. It just happens to be all in this database because it's a network install. 
So if we go to options, we'll see the same exact option settings of um, a normal WordPress install, except it's automatically appending the main site and putting the folder on there for us for the site URL and for home. So basically it's the same exact thing, it's just broken down and you can tell the difference by this number. So if you're moving a site, so we have a development version of our WordPress install and we have a live version. When we work on the development version, all we need to do is dump like blog ID 2 tables and import them into the live site and it will copy everything over. Um, the only caveat to that is you have to be careful about the, you know, the site URL because if it's the dev URL, then that's going to change and move it over. So all that stuff is stored in the database. The only thing that is really shared is the users table, the users and the user meta. Um, and there are some people who have hacked around that, but generally it's just better to leave it in groups. Do you have to do it just um, in the blog on the table for the user to see the blog have to edit? No, it's generally not good to do that. Um, you could, I mean, you could do it manually, just add all that stuff manually. The issue is that WordPress, like with their, you need to pay attention to the blog because it's keeping track of the current site ID. You want to add a new site ID. You don't want it to overwrite your tables. So that if you have a if you have a discrepancy such as the uh, kinesiology site is blog ID 13 on the live site, but it's blog ID 20 on the development site. Usually, it's best just to export the tables individually and then import them directly into the new table. That way, it's just the data being overwritten, not the actual table being created or, or, or renamed. That's the way I do it, at least. Okay. That's pretty much all I wanted to talk about with the network install. Any other thoughts or questions? Sorry, I totally forgot I was using Nginx, so. Uh, and of course, there's, you know, tons of documentation, create a network before you begin, and all these related articles. Um, so you're, you're best advice for yeah, yeah. It's it's easy enough to, to make it to do the install. Um, that I mean, it's almost as easy as just doing a regular install on WordPress. Is that you have to edit a couple files manually. But yeah, I would just do it. If you know you're going to do it, just do it. Even if you don't know you're going to do it, just do it. See what happens. Yeah. Because really, I don't want to be in a situation where I have a site and two years down the road I say, you know, let's turn this into a multi site. That kind of scares me a little bit because there's so many different changes that are going to happen. Um, now, I am actually planning on doing that uh, so <laughs> um, because I might personal server, I have six or seven WordPress installs, and whenever there's an update, I have to update them all manually, and it's starting to annoy me. Um, so I am thinking about doing a multi-site install on my primary domain, installing the domain script that will allow the other sites to keep their domain name, and I would do a subdirectory install. Of course, I've got to figure out how to do that with Nginx. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk about today was uh, how to queue up JavaScript and CSS the proper way. It was pretty important. There's a lot of bad plugins out there that just include JavaScript and 
causes conflict. Um, you're, you'll, you know, uh, most of the time it's in the admin section or something like that. They'll be asking you add a post and half the stuff won't work because they're not including Java or jQuery properly, or they're removing jQuery or adding a different version of jQuery. And it's just it's not the way to do it. So when you're adding custom scripts to your WordPress plugin or even your theme, you want to use the wp underscore and q underscore script action. Again, WordPress calls do action wp and q script. Um, this is for the front end of your site. If you're doing JavaScript query uh, or CSS on the back end, it'd be the admin underscore and q script. Um, so there's also a function called wp underscore and q script singular. Don't confuse that with the action name. It's different, but it's related. Um, that is the uh, script for queuing up JavaScript, or the function for queuing up JavaScript. The function for queuing up style sheets is WQ underscore and queue style. Now, these functions are the same whether or not you're in the admin or the back end, I mean, the uh, back end or the front end. Um, the only difference is the action that gets called. Uh, the WP action or the admin action, which are these um, WP and script, admin and script. Uh, so, I actually did this with our plugin. Let's make sure I have the latest version. So I created a version two of this plugin. I'm just going to copy these and let's just paste them in here. Thankfully, I don't have to paste. So, yeah, this is on the uh, multi site install. Go to Network Admin, we'll see in the plugin, there's the CatNet plugin. And I can network activate it. Or if I just go to my main site dashboard and go to plugins, I can activate it here. You notice I can't delete or edit or anything, I can only activate or deactivate. Um, actually, this may help here. If I go to plugins again and network activate and go back to dashboard, you see, um, oh, that's different. It's been a while since I've done this. So it never activated a Kismet, but it doesn't give me the option to deactivate it. Interesting. So let's just add a uh, widget real quick here to the front admin widget. And so what I'm going to do with the catnet widget, or what I already did, is I want to make I want to do a random picture of a cat without having to refresh the page. So we're going to use JavaScript, we're going to do Ajax, which are complicated things in WordPress, and we're also going to do some styling. So the first thing we do is um, in our widget, uh, I added an option right here to enable auto refresh. And so I just call it auto refresh. So if we look at our widget, you see there's a thing here, automatically refresh images, put a check mark there. Let's say I added that to our plugin, same exact way that I added um, all these other options. Uh, last time I talked about the selected helper function, I used the checked helper function. So I checked to see if auto refresh is set to on, 
Um, if it is, then it's when I refresh this page. It saves Jeff. So if we look at our front page, there's our cat is Jeff. Okay, so let's not look at it too much because it's going to work too well. All right. So there's a couple things here. Let's ignore these lines for now. But WP and Q scripts. This is called for the front end of your website, not the back end. If we were going to be doing styling or AJAX or jQuery stuff on the back end, we'd use the admin underscore in script. And we're going to call this function called that I named in catnet script. Down here. And ignore this for now. Let's just ignore the. JavaScript for now and just look at the style. So this is the function WP and Q style. Again, it's going to be the same function for whether or not you're doing it in the back end or the front end. It's just a different action. So the only difference is up here, this. You're going to use the same function to do the enqueuing. This takes several different variables. This is just um, kind of like a label or a tag that you want to name it. It's kind of a reference point. So, um, if if I needed something to, if I needed this to be called after another CSS file was called, let's say that I had two CSS files: cat name underscore CSS and custom underscore CSS. Well, I want cat name CSS to be called first. But I want custom to be called after catnip. So this is the dependency, basically. It says, no matter what happens with these function calls, no matter what order I put these in, don't just don't call this CSS file the custom CSS file until the dependent CSS file has been called. So I don't have any dependencies for this, so it's just one. Uh, this is the plugin directory and the file catnip.css, which I have right here. And this is the version. Versioning is kind of important, especially if you're doing caching. Um, I would recommend if you ever change the CSS file in your plugin to change the version number here. And what that does is um, it appends a version tag to the CSS call in HTML. And if that version tag changes, the cache will update. If it doesn't change, the cache might not update, it might update, it'll, it'll be confusing, it works on some machines, it doesn't work on other machines, and then you'll be pulling your hair out. So I always include the version number and update the version if I ever change. So this is, and so this is pretty basic stuff. I just wanted to include some basic CSS here. Uh, we had already included these classes in our plugin. So I just went and set minimum width, minimum height, because that's what the small image is. Uh, same thing with medium image. Full image is just regular size, so I didn't set one. Um, I wanted to make the images centered, so I took the default class that we had already set up, and just did a text line center. Might not be the best way to do some of these things, but this is just an example. And I wanted to have some padding for those cases where people wanted to show five images on one page. It wasn't it was only doing like, you know, three pixels worth of padding on one or fifteen. So I just said that. Now if we create a page catnip. I'm gonna do catnip. And I don't remember what the page. Uh, again, remember this is a short code.
So these are all full-size images. It has the padding that I set up. But if we look at the source, this is, this is really what you want to see. There, this is the line right here. It has my catnet CSS queued up, has the version number. Um, also, another argument you can do here, I don't know if I did it on this one. You can do all, it's for the media site, which is the default, or if it's a CSS that you want to do for just for print or for web or mobile, you could set, you know, print. So this CSS file is just used for print. So when somebody prints the, the page, your plugin looks good. Um, but default is all, so you can leave it without it if you want. I'm sorry, where, where are you putting your version number of the CSS file? You put the, you, you state the version number here. Okay, but it doesn't. It's just a trick. Oh. It's all it is is it's it's changing what the HTML output is. So when it, when the Firefox is attached, it sees that change and says, "Oh, this is a new file." I think it's just basically tricking the browser into thinking there's a new file included on this page. There's no actual version number or anything like that. Um, it's just a tricky hack. Um, at least that's my experience. I could be completely wrong. But uh, it's just, it, it, this is really more important in the JavaScript situation. Yeah? In the media site, do you animate or do you have to do a separate file for print and mobile? Uh, let's look. I think you have to do separate uh, script. It may take arrays, though. I'm not sure. This is, this is not. Oh, this is script style. Media, a string, you can do I guess it's just a string, so you could do comma separated. Um, so it would be all comma screen, comma print, or something like that. Or you wouldn't do all, I guess in that case, but screen, comma, Print comma mobile or something like that. They do have a list here, but yeah, in the in a normal CSS fashion, you can do comma separated. So it's just a string. So if you wanted to, you could do screen print, and that would work. Okay. So yeah, the version number is just the browser basically uh, and that could be wrong about that but uh, I've never seen anyone use it for anything other than that so that's pretty simple um, that's the way to do it it's it's not as important in um, CSS file I mean the important the important thing is the dependency if you have a file that's going to be called you if you have a custom file, you want it to be called after your plugin CSS file. So they would set a dependency to make sure that theirs gets called after that. And where this is helpful is you have a plugin with the default style, and they want to overwrite that. They can add this to their um, functions.php in their theme and say the dependency is the cat nip underscore CSS tag. And then when WordPress does all the processing, it doesn't matter what WordPress finds first as far as these function calls. It's just going to say, oh, this goes under here. That way, if there's an overwrite on that CSS, it works. Uh, let's see. Okay. And there's our pretty cat. I'm going to refresh our page. There's even queue for cat. That's weird. Okay. So the next thing we want to talk about is queuing up JavaScript. And we're going to do Ajax and JavaScript at the same time. Let's just talk about JavaScript first. The same basic functionality. 
you have your tag that you're assigning this call, your call to the actual file, which is what we have here. Um, this is an array of dependencies. So our script depends on jQuery being loaded first, so we want to make sure we put jQuery there. If we didn't put that there, we run the risk of this being called before jQuery gets called, and then our plugin doesn't, or our Java doesn't work because it's saying, hey, this function doesn't exist because jQuery hasn't been called yet. So it's very linear. And again, the, the version number. There's no media associated with it. So if you change the JavaScript, make sure you just update this number. Just increment it. Some people just set this to be whatever the current version number is of the plugin. Um, so I don't know if we're setting it up here. Probably not. Yeah, we're not. Uh, you could have like a global variable of the plugin's version number and just put that global variable here and anytime you update your plugin, that changes and then you don't have to worry about it. So uh, in JavaScript, I highly recommend using uh, jQuery no conflict. Um, it just helps with compatibility issues. So all you do is jQuery, uh, and I'm not really awesome at jQuery, I just know how to break things. So jQuery no conflict, and I set a variable, and then from this point on, I use that variable to reference um, jQuery no conflict. Uh, so this is just my file, and what we want to do is we want every five seconds we want it to refresh the images so new images show up. With Ajax. So what we're getting into now is Ajax, if you didn't know. Ajax is asynchronous JavaScript. Uh, basically what it does is it executes functions through JavaScript that, in, that are in your PHP file. WordPress has often built in Ajax support. So there's less of a learning curve if you're trying to learn Ajax. Uh, there's two things two actions that are called, depending on if this is front end or back end. Uh, and what I mean by that is, the, if you're doing it on the front end and users are not logged in, you have to worry about this no privilege action. If you're doing it on the front end and people aren't logged in, like you're not, they're not gonna be accessing an Ajax section of your site without being logged in, you don't really have to worry about the no priv. No priv just means they don't have any privileges, they're still allowed to run these functions. So there's two basic actions. WP underscore Ajax underscore no priv and WP underscore Ajax underscore. And then there's the action that you're calling. So if we look at our JavaScript file, this is the action. We're going to send this to the WordPress Ajax function. It's going to take this action from the data array and look to see if there's any, it's, it's going to run the do action on WP underscore Ajax underscore catnip refresh. So I want to make sure that this and this are going to be the same as my action call here. We'll get into this whole JavaScript file. And so this is again another just add action. WordPress is going to call this because I'm sending that information to the WordPress Ajax file. And when it runs that action, I want to run this function, do catnip refresh. Uh, so do cat and refresh. Basically, we're going to get all the information that's sent, and we're going to get the catnip outfit, which is, this is a function I created. Before we had on the short code in the widget, we had basically duplicated its functionality. It was getting the XML, and then it was formatting that XML, and then it was outputting the HTML to display the images. They're basically the same thing, except for some said widget and some said shortcode, but same 
functionality. So what I did was I took those functions, and I created a new function called get cat nip output output in here. It takes these variables. Is it the widget or a short code? The arguments you want to send? Uh, what's the unique ID? Um, and the reason for the unique ID is because of the jQuery stuff and the Ajax stuff I added because you don't want changes to multiple widgets if they have multiple widgets. Um, you only want to change the unique ID you're working with. And whether or not this is a replace call, which is what we're doing with the Ajax. So anyway, this is basically the same code. I just copied it and I added a few things like these hidden input fields, which I use in JavaScript. So if we look at a JavaScript, I have a interval set every five seconds. I want it to run the catnip refresh function in JavaScript. And I'm not going to get into the coding too much, but you know this is a jQuery dot each function. It's going to get every instance on your screen or in the HTML of a class named catnip widget. Actually, this should say catnip shortcode. And catnip shortcode. This is basically like a for loop, but it's simple. So it gets each one, and it runs through each one. It says, okay, the one I'm looking at right now, does it have a child named input auto refresh? If we look at here, we have our hidden input named auto refresh. And in our widget, if it's checked, it's set to on. So we, here we say, if on equals this value, then we want to do Ajax on this. So some, you know, they may have a short code on a page with a widget that they want the widget to refresh, but the, they don't want the short code to refresh. So we, they need to specify whether or not they want it to refresh. So this way, with each of these values, we have we have the widget, we have the short code. The short code won't refresh because it hasn't been set to refresh if they haven't Put that argument, but the widget will, because you know we have it set to do so. Uh, then I want to grab. I just want to grab the unique ID, which is just another setting. It's a new option I added here, unique ID. This way, I'm sure to only update the widget that this is looking at right now. The issue is that you have two widgets, and you're not looking at a unique ID. You're just looking at the so you're just looking at this catnip class. When it does the update, if you're doing the update on the catnip class, it'll update everything on that page that's in the catnip class, right? So we assign it a unique ID. That way, we can be sure to only update the unique widget we're looking at, at in, within this loop. And in the next loop, we'll look at the next unique ID, and the next loop will look at the next unique ID. Uh, it also prevents, you know, because with these cat pictures, you have three widgets, they're all showing one different picture, um, and you're not looking at a unique ID, when it gets the information and updates it, it'll update all three, and you'll have three of the same picture. And the next time, it'll update all three, and so forth. So this data array gets sent to the WordPress Ajax file. And we're sending it the action, we're sending it the, the all this information, whether or not it's a widget or a shortcode, unique ID, API key, all the stuff that we accept as values. And then we send this to Ajax. That's what this is right here. Uh, and then this is what replaces the current HTML with whatever is the response from that uh, Ajax call. Now, there's another difference from the back end to the front end. Technically speaking, the front end doesn't have an accessible AJAX built in. You need special privileges to, to get to it. Um, it. AJAX is only built into the back end of WordPress. The front end, you have to do uh, a special trick to use the back end's AJAX on the front end. So if we look at our in queue catnip scripts function. We're queuing our script, but 
We don't have an AJAX function. So you can use the one that's in the admin, but you need to use this WP localized script function. Uh, this, let's look at what these uh, values are. I don't know. Back end would be the dashboard. Front end would be the just the front facing website. What people what normal people see when they go to your site. Right. So this is this is the back end. This is the front end. What people see when they go to your site. Uh, so dashboard or main website would be another. You know what I mean? Okay. But um, when the I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, so but it's your um, but when they said it on the back end and they're doing it, they're not just applying it to the dashboard, right? They're applying it to the um, or not. Mm -hmm. No, not necessarily. So WordPress calls different actions depending on where you are on the site. I mean, technically speaking, it's all front end or it's all back end, but you need to have special privileges to see certain things. The dashboard would be considered a back end because you can do administration sort of functionality to it. The front end of the site is really just what normal people are gonna see when they visit your site. You don't want them seeing the post edit screen when they're just visiting your site. So it's 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 a distinction that's made depending on what what the visitor is looking at. Um, so with these function calls, we can have certain things happen on the front end of the of the website or what normal people see, and certain things only happen when they're visiting the dashboard of the site. So there's there's just a built-in distinction. Does that make sense? So, so when you were talking about the um, WPHP script, yeah. you're saying use that if you want it to, the, whatever you're trying to do, to show up on the front page right. versus if you want it to only show up in the back side. Right. So like showing these text or whatever, you're saying whether or not you want it to show up on the actual web page or you only want to see something visible right. on in the dashboard. So this might help. Uh, this is so this is the front of the website. The front facing people people see this on the website. Mm -hmm. If we look at the page source, we have our CSS file that we put in with this WP underscore NQ script action. If we go to the back end, just refresh, and we view page source, catnip.css, it's not in here. Right. And and this is just a way to keep, this is really a way to keep things real clean. In the back end, the da dashboard, there's things that you can also do to keep things even more clean. Like you don't want your CSS file to load on every page. You just want it to load on your plugin page. So you can specify in your in script function if the page is or if the page current page that you're looking at is our plugin page, basically. Then you include our CSS file. Otherwise, don't include it. Same thing with JavaScript. You don't want to include your JavaScript that changes something about the way the post adding a new post works in the adding a new categories page. So you can specify if you're on a page where you're adding a new post, then use my JavaScript. Uh, and people will love you if you do that because otherwise things are gonna probably break because somebody's gonna screw something up and um, you're also loading extra JavaScript that you don't need to load in certain places. Does that clear up? Yeah. Okay. So our, our localized script uh, function, which was what we need to do to call the Ajax, uh, takes a handle, an object name, and then this is just some internationalization. So 
So the way that I always do it is you, you enqueue your script with a handle, and then you use that same handle in your localization script. And there's an object name and array. If we look at this, uh, there's the handle name, which is the same as our enqueue script. Uh, and then, what is this? The object name that we want to give it, catnip hat. And this is the actual, I guess it's technically internationalized, internationalization. I don't really know why they're calling that. It's either, I think it's L. L can Oh, Maybe. Oh, yes, you're right. Localization. Um, so, Ajax URL, and then the, this function admin URL, just if you give it a file name, it outputs the actual URL of that file. So, if somebody changes the location of WB admin, you don't, the plugin doesn't know that. You know, I'm a plugin writer, I don't know what your current WB admin location is. But admin URL uses the WordPress functionality to tell your plugin what it is. So this localization script is what you need. So you only need this if, if you're doing something on the front end or what the front facing website. On the back end, the admin dash ajax.php is called on every page. So if you're on the dashboard, you don't need to do this. This is only if you're doing things on the front. So Save those settings. And we can look at refresh this page. And look at the page source. And there's right here. It adds this. This is what the localization script does. It adds a variable called catnip ajax. With the ajax is the um, handle and then the URL to the ajax script, which is the dash admin admin dash ajax. And this is how Ajax works. You know, you you call a specific um, file when you want to do some Ajax functionality. And this is just built into WordPress and does all sorts of fancy stuff. So again, it just makes things easier. So in our back to our JavaScript file, what we're doing is we're sending this payload right here, this data, to the catnip Ajax Ajax URL. This is is if I can find it. This and Ajax URL is this. So because it's already included on the page, these these things are already defined. You're sending the data array, and you're expecting a response. And with our response, and all we're doing is calling uh, the catnip output. So this is the Ajax call. Remember, here was the action, catnip refresh, which is the WP underscore Ajax underscore catnip refresh, or WP underscore Ajax underscore no priv underscore catnip refresh. Calls this function. It gets the variables that are being sent through Ajax, which is basically a post. Um, like if you're doing a post on a form or a get, um, I always use request because it takes both get or post. There may be specific examples where you want to use one or the other, but for these sort of situations, I just use request. I say if it's set, then use it. Otherwise, set it to blank. Just like in our when we were doing our widget and our short code, we're just building this array that we're going to use to build this, this information we send to the cat API to get the XML file back and the parser. Um, I do check to see if W or S is set, which is the new thing I added, to see if it's a widget or a shortcode, and see if unique is set, unique ID is set. So I, want, I need both of those in order to have it be a successful thing. And then I send that to the catnip output function, which I have down here. And you know, widget or shortcode, ARPs, unique ID. Oh yes, replace. Because I'm doing this refresh, I also set replace to true. It defaults to false in my function. 
And the reason for that is in my JavaScript, I don't want to replace the, I just want to um, change the inside of that main div. I don't want to replace the whole thing. Uh, so in my functionality, I say if it's, if it's not a replace, then we'll include the main div. If it is a replace, don't include it and just replace everything in that div with all of this information. So like I said before, I included these hidden input variables. Um, and this is just for my AJAX script, really. I, I get the XML up here. I parse the XML here, get the new images, and then I return that output. And so I did the same, I, you know, I, in my widget, I changed it, just get that output. So in my widget, I send the widget value, because it's a widget, the instance, which is the setting that I have for that widget, and the widget ID is the unique ID for that widget. In my short code, there's not, the API is a little different for the short code, there's no really unique ID, so I kind of made one up. So. I added a global post variable. So in the short code, when the short code code is called, and somebody's viewing the page that it's on, it'll have a post ID. So that's what I'm going to use for my unique ID. So, and this isn't foolproof, by the way, and I'll tell you why in a second. I have my default variables. Whatever variables are sent by the user are set as an argument sent. Same function. Short code, not widget, arguments to send, and my unique ID is post ID. The reason why this probably isn't a great idea is if they have two short codes on the same page, they'll have the same unique ID. I don't think there's a real good way around that, and if, in our case, it's probably unlikely they're going to do this because um, our plugin displays multiple images. There's no real reason why they include two different short codes unless they wanted some content in between them or something like that. Um, but, you know, this is the best I could do for now. I haven't thought of a better way. So, let's go to our front page and hope that this works. I'm going to refresh. Okay. Every five seconds, it should change. There you go. And, yeah. Let's go to the widget here. So if I change this, I want to see three images on the front page. Um, oh, you know what else we can do? Let's add another widget. Thing. And we're not going to do a refresh on this one. And we'll just keep that one image static. Yeah. Refresh the page. Okay. There's three and one. And hopefully, okay, those three changed. And that one stayed the same. Those three changed. And that one stayed the same. And that's because I'm using the unique ID. If I didn't have, if I wasn't paying attention to a unique ID, they'd all change and it would all get clunky. I mean, it's kind of clunky now because these are different sizes and stuff. And it's, it's not like a smooth fade in or anything like that. But this is really just to show you how to do it. So, I mean, these are <laughs> pretty important topics because. Uh, it's showing you how to properly enqueue the JavaScript, how to properly enqueue CSS, and also how to do AJAX. And really, this is a more complicated way to do AJAX because we're doing it on this part of the site, not the dashboard. Doing it on the dashboard is a lot easier because you don't have to do the localized section. You just have to worry about including your jQuery. Uh, also, just so you know, I was working on this last night. Uh, I spent a long time last night working on this, and I just could not get, it would refresh once, and then it wouldn't refresh again. And this is a typical problem for anyone who's ever developing anything. It just doesn't work, and you don't know why. And this morning I got up and I sent my mess, a message to my friend, and I said, I need your help. 
Why is this only refreshing once? He looked at it and 20 seconds later he said, oh, you're forgetting to set your refresh value when you refresh the, code, the HTML code. And I was like, ah. And that's just one small little thing. You think, you, you, you look at everything and you just think it's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. And sometimes you just need a second pair of eyes. So that's that. Enough of them cats. Okay. Any questions? Oh, we went into this already. Right? Uh, WordPress is built in AJAX script. So if you look like script, you're using it on the front end. And then WP AJAX, WP AJAX now priv. Uh, they all call the function you want to run during your AJAX call. And you got to make sure that those function names are the same as that action name. Adding pot to your plugin. The pot file is the translation file that people are going to use to translate into Russian and Chinese and stuff. So through the development of our plugin, we've been doing the localization. Um, let's see if I can find an example here. Uh, it's catted a every day in WordPress. It's a catnip local domain. So uh, So here, yeah, then you need to add your text domain to your plugin. So first, let's talk about the easiest thing in the world about WordPress and plugin development. Creating the pot file. Go to your admin section, click the button that says continue to generate pot file. Nice if this was going a little bit quicker. What should normally happen is uh, you'll get a list of uh, everything in your subversion repository. You can get a pot file from the files in your trunk or in your tagged versions. So if we look at our subversion repository, um, what will happen is if you select trunk, it's going to scan through all your PHP files for localized output, and it's going to generate that pot file automatically for you. Or it'll, or you can choose your tag. So our current version is 1.0.1. The version that we just created is 1.0.2. Okay, here we go. Generate pot file. We want to use 1.0.2 because that's the most recent. We change some text. Let's just say get the pot file, and it will output a um, file. Save it, and let's just, yeah, let's just do it. Plugins, cabinet. We're going to put in this directory I had already pre-created called i18n. And there it is. That's all you need to do to create your pop file. If we look at it, what this, what all this is is saying, and these are just the default strings. Uh, it's cat day every day in WordPress. It's cat API. Somebody's going to create a translation file and email it to you. You put it in your i18n directory, and if somebody has that language set in their WordPress, then it would have the translation rather than the English string. Um, and there's not very many of these. You know, unique ID of image return. Uh, somebody knows what, what how that's translated in Russian. They'll translate it for you. Some people will just give you a partial translation, so yeah, you have to you have to be trustworthy. I mean, you have to tr you have to be trusting. Um, it's unlikely that somebody's going to put in a lot of energy to put curse words in your plugin, but you never know. Uh, but we're not done yet. We need to set the text domain right here. 
So if we go to our PHP, this is our main plugin PHP. Again, scroll all the way down. I added this code here. Load plugin text domain. There's also load theme text domain. It's basically the same thing. Catnip, this has to be the same as your, you know, when we did these translations. Let's see if I can find one. Um, in fact, see right here, this could be translated. I should probably change that. Uh, so catnip, this is the text domain. This is the text domain for these strings. So this needs to be the same as whatever you've been setting it as. I um, can't remember what the fault is. Yeah, or the administrator. Yeah. yeah. Um, so absolute relative path default is false. I guess it's deprecated. Um, so it's just always false. Plugin directory again. This is just this will get the directory of your plugin based on the current file, which is this main file, and then. The directory that we're keeping the pot file in. So I, like I said, I created one called the i18n, and I put that pot file in there. That's it. Your plugin is now translatable. Somebody can send you a translation, and all you have to do is upload it to your i18n folder and say, hey, look, we've got a translation in, you know, Russian or whatever. You're only going to get translations from people who like your plugin, are using it, and want to have time, want to spend some time translating your thing so that they don't have to figure it out on their own. But if you have a premium plugin, one that you're selling, and you want it translated, you can do like some sort of incentive, you know, half off my plugin if you send a translation or something like that, or half off the subscription, or you know, free subscription or something. Like that. So that's all you need to do to translate or set up your plugin for translation, it's really easy. Again, typical WordPress makes things very easy. And of course, there's a very great link on translation, um, pot files. You, you will get a PO file and an MO file, most likely, when somebody sends you a translation. It's just different types of translation formats. Um, everything about text domains, marking strings, so if you don't include a text domain, um, the translation, I think, I don't know if it'll work properly, or if you leave the, if you leave this blank if you don't include a text domain. I'm not sure. I just always include one to make sure. I just use the same name as my plugin. And there's all sorts of stuff like best practices and don't include URLs in your. Um, section to be translated because URL shouldn't be translated. It kind of helps avoid the risk of somebody putting, you know, spam links in your in your translations or something like that. Uh, there's also yeah, a really great thing here. You can translate JavaScript files. Um, it, it's a little complicated in the JavaScript file how you how you do this. Um, but it's really interesting. So you can output text with JavaScript or jQuery, and it will be translated because it's calling back to your WordPress translation. So it's pretty cool. Uh, OK. Let's talk about the transient API. I think this is, this is it for the day. Uh, I was, you know, I was planning on talking about more APIs today. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, but I, I was looking through them, and we've gone over most of them. Um, we've gone over widgets. We've gone over, uh, we've kind of gone over database with setting options and meta, uh, stuff like that. Uh, we've gone over the HTTP API because that's how we're pulling the information from the CAT API with using the, the functions built into the HTTP API. Uh, we haven't gone over file header. I've never used it. I've never used file system metadata related to database. There are um, other functions for the metadata API where you can be 
uh, more specific as where you want metadata to go to. Uh, again, Options API is related to database API. Plugin API, we built a plugin. We haven't done anything with re rewrite. I generally stay away from rewrite just because you can kind of screw up the site uh, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but there are times where you do need to kind of mess with it and see what's going on. So it would be important. I couldn't think of any real good examples to do with it though. Uh, settings API, we did that with the plugin. Shortcode API, we did that. We discussed the theme modification API in the sense that 2010 or 2010, 2011 are using it, uh, but we didn't do anything with it. I, I, I'm not a theme builder, so I don't really do much with it. Uh, and we've done widgets. So the only thing really left was transient API. I think it's transient, not transient. Um, so a transient, is basically a an option. It's a data set in the WordPress options table that has an expiration date attached to it, or expiration time set to it. Uh, it's really awesome. It's really useful. Um, before this, people would kind of like hack and get what they wanted to do with like you know serialized arrays and stuff. But the transient API does all that for you. All you need to do is give it a name a value and a, and a time when it expires. The one thing that could probably use some work is uh, if a transient value expires, but no one tries to access that value again, it'll live in your database forever. Um, but if it if somebody tries to access it and it's expired, it will delete it automatically. Uh, so again, it's, it's very similar to the options API, which added features to expiration time, um, which simplified the process of using the uh, options database. It's good for storing cache information. Uh, but this morning I, I woke up and I was thinking, what am I going to do with Transient API? I use it on my, uh, I have a premium plugin, it's a subscription-based plugin, and it um, publishes to Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and front feed automatically on your behalf whenever you up, up publish a new post. Facebook and Twitter and all these services have rate limits. So you're only allowed to post 350 times an hour to Twitter or whatever it is. Now. And part of my responsibility as a plugin developer and a developer for Twitter apps is to make sure I'm not sending a thousand requests from the same user, otherwise they're going to get mad at me. So I use Transient to detect this. If a user sends data to their Twitter account, I, I create a Transient and I say, all right, you have 350 in 60 minutes, and um, I add start adding those calls to an array. And then when they post again, I get that information. It's got the same option name because it's like their it's like WV underscore transient underscore their API key. Like that. So it'll you know, get that transient. If it exists, then it will say how many elements exist in this array that I'm keeping track of. And it'll say there's 50 elements. Okay, you can post this. There's 350 elements. No, sorry, you can't post this because you've gone over your 350 limit and give them an error. That's how, that's really the first time I used Transient. I was trying to figure out how can I rate limit people. Um, and it may not be the best solution, but it was pretty awesome when I did it and I love it. But for this, we're going to do something different. This is a little bit more simple. Let me copy this and create a directory here and use dash plugin. And login limit. So this morning, I was looking at Facebook and a guy I follow said, hey, you should install this plugin on WordPress. And it was a login limit plugin. If somebody tries to hack into your site, they're going to try to, you know, they're going to try 500 different 
username and passes within three seconds. This will stop that. This is a little bit more basic. And I looked at his plugin. He doesn't use train sense, which I thought was kind of different. Um, I wanted to use train genes. He looked at a lot more different things. I just wanted to give you a basic example to show you how train genes work. So uh, we're, we're taking this action that WordPress calls whenever there's a failed login attempt, WP underscore login fail. And I just I created a function called failed underscore login. Probably need it better. But it sends a username. We're going to ignore the username for now. Because all we really care about is uh, repeated attempts from the same IP address. So our limit is five within 30 seconds. And we're going to call our transient name failed underscore login underscore and their IP address. And this is like a unique variable because you don't want somebody to, um, if you use a username here, for instance, username isn't real, it's unique, but it's unique in a way that if I know your username, I can try logging into this account over and over again. But when you come from a different computer, you, you are you. You know your username and you know your password. And you try to log in, it's going to say, hey, you've tried too many times. And you're going to say, what the heck? I, I, just, I just came to my computer. So you want something that's really unique in the sense that if somebody's doing something malicious in this case, um, you're not punishing the actual user. So the first thing I do is I get the transient which is this transient name, failed login and their IP address. This get IP address function, I just grab this off the web. It just gets their IP address, um, and it uses a number of different methods to try to get the IP address. Um, so it gets the IP address. So the transient is going to be failed underscore login underscore IP address. Uh, if, if this doesn't exist, it's going to return false which I'm going to cast as an array, and then I'm going to add a timestamp to the array, and then set the transient, which is the same transient name, so that user, the calls array, which just has all the number of calls in there, and then the time limit, 30 seconds. So if they make five calls in 30 seconds, they get put in here, and all that does is set the transient. Now we need to make sure to tell them and prevent them from trying again for another 30 seconds or another five minutes if you want or whatever it is. So the next thing I did is I looked at the login script and I found there's a login underscore init action that's called. And I want to check to see if the user who's visiting this page is limited. So I have created this function called check the limited login. Transient, it's the same thing as here. I get I get the IP address of the person visiting the login page. I get those transients. And then I count. Now I don't have to do anything else really when I'm getting the transient. If the transient has expired, then it's going to return false and the count is you know, a count of false is zero. Um, if it hasn't expired, then there's going to be an array that's returned. And if that array is four, it's okay. If it's six, it shouldn't be okay. Uh, actually, I think in this case it might be seven. I can't remember. But what I do want to do is if it's over that allotted number, I just want to kill the page and tell them, hey, you've exceeded the login tents. Try again in five minutes. I said five minutes, but really 30 seconds would work. And really 30 seconds is all you need because a hacker, they're just trying to hit your system. And if every fifth time they have to wait 30 seconds, they're just going to give up because that's exponential in their time of actually being able to hack into your account. So let's upload this. You can 
and open up. All right, let's log out. Try logging out. I mean, logging in. And fake password. There you go. Now, when we wait 30 seconds, it will work again. And again, you know, I said five minutes, but I could say 30 seconds, really. Yeah. Yeah, say five minutes. And so, you know, I'm off of WP admin or login screen. It doesn't matter what they do or, or how they try to do anything. Oh, it's been 30 seconds. So now I can log in for real and everything's kosher. Uh, another, well, we can't really do it. This is the same IP address, but what, and because we're tracking it by IP address, if you're logged in at the time, or you're going to log in at the time, but I'm trying to hack your account at the same time, you're not going to be affected by it. So you won't even know what's happening. And this is just, you know, people use random usernames that they think they know and stuff like that. So they may not be targeting you, they just guess the username that happened to be your username. <laughs> so the the guy's plug in that, that inspired this little lesson. Um, he does a lot more complicated things. I haven't really looked into it, but this would be just a really basic way to do what he's doing. Um, and he's, I might consider uh, turning this into another plugin and and beefing it up a bit because I think this could be useful and I think we might use it on our own site here. I never even thought about doing something like this until this morning. Yeah. Um, but, and I will tell you, in the past two months, I have dealt with several WordPress websites who have been hacked because of insecure passwords. And either they got the passwords from like a Wi Fi, you know, unsecured Wi Fi, and it wasn't through SSL. Or it was somebody just trying a bunch of yeah, dictionary attack passwords. Uh, with this, that would prevent that. Very, you know, very simple script. What is it? Um, 57 lines, really. You know, even less. Um, so you could save yourself a lot of time, a lot of headache. Mm -hmm. Another thing too, and I think I mentioned this in my class, is um, the MO that these hackers have been doing lately is they'll edit a, a plugin that's not activated on your site. Because you can edit those and break them all you want, and it doesn't break your site. Um, and so they'll, what they'll do is they'll put in a bunch of PHP and then go directly to that file which executes, downloads a bunch of stuff to your site, and then inject spam all over your site. So delete all your plugins that you're not using. And that's it. Any questions? Transients are pretty simple. You know, you're all, it's basically the options API, except you're adding an expiration time, and it does all the stuff for you. It removes it from the database when it expires. So when you get when you do the get transient, if it exists but the timestamp is expired, it just deletes it, returns false. We we don't have any designers on staff, but we kind of just use the talent that we have. There's no like official designer though, um, and some people have been reaching out to other third party designers to do some stuff like logo work, um, website design, stuff like that. A lot of that stuff ends up coming up to us in-house though, and you know we either just replicate what they like or um, we just work with them until they get to where they're comfortable with, with what it looks like. But we don't have any actual designers on staff. 
and I am definitely not a designer. I can recognize when something looks bad or when I think something looks good, but making it look good, I spend way too much time working on it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.